So here's a phylogeny of uh, Drosseraceae. Okay, there's 150 species. I've said this is a subsample. It's uh, 50 or 60 species. Um, the colours here represent um, the, the broad areas that they're from. Blue is Australian, so there's lots of Australian. Uh, we've got um, African clays up here. It's quite a sort of good geographic um, uh, relationships can be seen in the phylogeny. Okay, so we've got lots of Mediterranean type climate specialists within the sun hues. Um, and we look to the um, sort of paleogeography and uh, there's a suggestion that uh, these Mediterranean climates of so hot, dry summers, cold, wet winters arose about 15 to 10 million years perhaps. Um, uh, a little bit later than that, depending on um, whose uh, opinion you believe. Um, and that includes Southwest Australia and the South African Cape. Uh, uh, these climates appeared essentially when the circum Antarctic uh, polar current um, started. So the question that we then think is are these radiations within Drosera, or are these sort of, um, is the diversity in Southwestern Australia linked with this climate change in any way. So what we what we then did was to try to date the phylogeny. Um, so in order to date this, this is just a simplified version, just for um, visualisation. Okay. Um, the immediate sister taxa to Drosera is uh, this aquatic carnivorous plant called Aldrovanda ziculosa. Um, it's a monospecific and it has an excellent fossil record that goes back uh, about 50 million years, which allows us to place a really good, um, with high confidence, as high confidence as you can get when you're doing this sort of thing, calibration point on our phylogeny, so that we fix this date and then we can read off all of the others. So there's a particular clade of um, uh, sundews. Tuberous sundews. This is a picture of their tube, one of the tubers um, that's sort of south, um, southwest Australia um, specialists, okay, um, that have diversified according to our um, uh, temporally calibrated phylogeny around the Tiltonian, so around eight to ten million years ago. That fits nicely with our. Um, assumption of uh, the emergence of this particular biome at about uh, 10 million years and then a little bit afterwards we've got the diversification of the tuberous sundews. <coughs> so from a phylogenetic and using a dated phylogeny perspective we've got evidence for the emergence of a uh, Mediterranean climate specialist group uh, uh, around or shortly after the emergence of that particular um, uh, climate type. So then we thought, okay, can we um, use our um, ancestral niche reconstruction to try to validate this in some way? So here's our full phylogeny, and here's a climatic characteristic map on it. Okay, this is uh, some seasonal temperature measure. Greens and yellows are very low rainfall. The red, purples, and the blue is very high rainfall. And so there's sort of phylogenetic pattern within um, some clays that suggests that um, this environmental characteristic is it, it is demonstrating <coughs> phylogenetic pattern. Um, if we want to reconstruct an ancestral niche by reconstructing individual climate characteristics, one of the sort of founding assumptions is that our characteristics display some heritability. So if we had some random pattern that doesn't show phylogenetic conservancy, we shouldn't be using this to reconstruct uh, any ancestral niche because 
that character isn't displaying any phylogenetic uncertainty. So there's some tests that we can do to test for phylogenetic uncertainty, and this is just one um, uh, random sort of randomization test. Okay, when you um, map characters on a tree, you can get um, a, a consistency index that sort of suggests how well your data fit on the tree, how much step change you have across the tree. You can then randomize your data across the tree and then look at your observed value against your randomizations. Okay, and this gives you a uh, significant value. So this um, uh, sort of consistency index equivalent for continuous characters is called a QBI and we can then perform our randomization test to say which of our um, directly measured in environmental characteristics show phylogenetic conservancy. So we did this for our sun dews, um, the numbers in brackets are the QBI values, the little uh, stars show those that, are, uh, that show significant phylogenetic conservancy. Um, interestingly, the seasonal um, precipitation values are showing up as um, significant. And that's useful because they're the ones that help define our um, Mediterranean climates. So after we did that, we could then develop our um, uh, niche model stage of our individual species. Again, this is just a little um, <coughs> subset for demonstration. Okay. And this is our extant species modeled and projected into our extant environment. Um, okay, mostly um, southern Australia. We can then do our ancestral reconstruction and then for um, visualization we can project that ancestral region reconstruction into our present day climate scenarios to do a comparison. Okay? <coughs> How does this ancestral reconstruction uh, uh, compare with those species that we see um, the, the extent species on our phylogeny. Okay? So what we're getting is something different, something that's heavily influenced by the uh, Peltata and the, the, the widest range species. But this doesn't give us any idea of um, ancestral area because what this is showing is uh, a realisation of this ancestral niche within present day climate. What we really <coughs> want to do is to project this model into climate reconstructions. So there's lots and lots of work on um, uh, temperature modeling, particularly with a, 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 a focus on looking at um, climate change. But equally, there's quite a, a, a large amount of work that essentially run those models backwards to produce climate reconstructions. And so here's a picture of, um, I think, this annual mean temperature um, at around 10 million years. And as a comparison, is present day annual mean temperature. I, I hope what you sort of immediate, immediately see is how blocky this looks, because the ancestral uh, paleo uh, climate reconstructions all, uh, rely on underlying assumptions such as paleo geography. Um, and you know these are incredibly uncertain, um, and the idea that we can get this level of accuracy when we're trying to reconstruct, you know, um, climate from many millions of years ago, it's, it's just not going to happen. This is uh, uh, the the best resolution that um, uh, the uh, paleoclimatologist that we spoke to. This was by uh, Paul Valdez at the University of Bristol. Um, this is basically the best resolution we can get and if you look at uh, the coastlines you get this really sort of big blocky uh, image. Okay, so uh, we took this model of our ancestral um, tuberous sun dew. We dated the phylogeny to about um, 8 million years and this is a paleo reconstruction of roughly that time period. We're going to say roughly that time period. The, um, the phylogeny has uh, a 
the dates on the phylogeny has an error bars of one or two million years. The paleoclimate reconstructions at this time scale have an error bar of one or two million years. But interestingly, um, and what I sort of felt as a validation is that um, we projected this model into the paleoclimate reconstructions, and what we get is a southern Australian distribution that's in the, the, uh, you know, the core preference zone for these um, uh, sundews. So this tells me that these southern Australian uh, sundews, uh, their ancestor, you know, could have happily lived in the same area. <coughs> One more example with the sundews. Um, and, and I have showed maybe it shows the value of um, these ancestral re type reconstructions in, in terms of um, you know, uh, giving a, a, a different a different line of evidence to support hypotheses. Uh, this doesn't come out very well here, but here's a map of the world. Here's the distribution for Drosera stenopetula. It's found in New Zealand. Its sister species, Drosera uniflora, is found in Patagonia. Okay, and this um, this pattern of um, closely related species being found in New Zealand and Patagonia is something that's repeated in lots and lots of other um, um, organisms. So these two uh, sister species. So that sort of um, brings up a question: Can we sort of say anything about um, where the ancestral area is? Was it New Zealand? Was it Patagonia? Was it somewhere else? Okay. And when did that divergence happen? Well, we've got the data that allows us to present an answer to that question. We've dated the tree. This ancestral node dates to around 8 million years ago. Okay. We've done our um, ancestral um, climate character reconstruction, so here's the mean temperature for uh, the New Zealand species, the mean temperature for the uh, Patagonian species, and the mean temperature for our reconstruction is quite a bit higher. But we can project our reconstructed niche into a paleoclimate reconstruction for the same time period, and it allows us to answer the question, which was the ancestral area? New Zealand, Patagonia, maybe somewhere else. Okay, what we get is an unambiguous New Zealand as the um, core in terms of climatic uh, 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 preference for our reconstruction. So we start with a question, we end up with an answer. <coughs> so um, that's, that's the sort of first example. I'm going to move on to uh, 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 another group, um, uh, Sikkim. Sikkimen are another Mediterranean um, plant specialist, um, but this time they're sort of um, European um, distribution. There's only 25 species, but these 25 species uh, are actually um, exhibit a wide range of um, tolerance. Um, of those 25 species, you can find a species that flowers in every month of the year. Um, they're insect pollinated. They've also got particular characteristics that um, show adaptation to a Mediterranean type climate. So, like our tuberous sundews, some cyclamen have this um, thick core, which um, essentially serves the same purpose as the tuber in that um, over, over summer the plants die back, um, um, exist in the soil, and then grow up when the rainfall comes. This is their native distribution. Uh, again, cyclamen are quite a um, pretty flower used a lot in gardening, so there's really good collection data by people very keen to find new flowers. Uh, and this is a distribution map um, based on uh, the work of um, Gray Wilson, um, showing the native distribution. Um, Country-wise, Turkey is the, the hotspot, it's got 11 species. Um, there's one outlier, Cyclamen somalette is was recorded a couple of, I think once, maybe twice, in Somalia, 
uh, unsurprisingly, it's not been collected for 30 years. Um, and then there's also um, non-native distributions. Um, cyclamen uh, grow wild in the UK now. Um, so that distribution, you, um, sorry, you see quite a lot of overlap in terms of here's the, the number of species present. So you get four, three, two. So lots of the area shows multiple species in the same region. When you look at this from a phylogenetic perspective, what you see is that um, sister species don't overlap. Okay, we've got um, what's called allopatric distribution. Okay, allopatric distribution essentially means that um, closely related species don't occur in the same area. The uh, uh, alternative is sympatric distribution, where you've got range overlap between species. When we looked at the entire phylogeny, what we found was that um, no two sister species had any range overlap, except for um, Cyclum baliericum and Cyclum repandum, which has a tiny overlap just there um, on the sort of France, Italy border. Okay? But this is quite a, um, a surprising pattern given the, the amount of overlap for the, for the, 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 the genus as a whole. Okay, um, so what we did is we um, again produced a, a chronogram, a, a temporally calibrated phylogeny. Here's our date axis, okay? the um, chrome node of the cyclamen we dated to um, about. Uh, 12 million years, plus or minus two. Uh, okay, and what we what we thought was uh, okay. Let's look at um, certain characteristics of these species. These are uh, flowers that are um, grown and um, cultivated a lot, and so there's been lots of hybridization experiments on these. And what we see is the little X's here, being that um, these species have been demonstrated to, to readily hybridize. Okay? So what you can see is that closely related species often hybridize. Okay? But then we try to map, okay, what kind of, you know, there's, um, there's um, geographic separation between lots of these species. Um, so what kind of barrier do we have between them? So here we've got cyclamen, crepticum, and vividum, and here we've got a um, Mediterranean sea barrier that basically um, keeps the distribution apart. Okay, and then here the green triangles show geographic barriers between these species. So here, cyclamen mirabile, cyclamen intaminatum have a geographic barrier between them. So um, if we've got this um, geographic barriers between our sister species, we've got um, you know, um, uh, some questions about how this particular pattern arose. Okay? And there's sort of two hypotheses for, for this sort of um, distribution patterns. Okay? One is dispersal, that we've got our two um, uh, distributions. Okay? At some point in the past we had one distribution and then the uh, you know, one uh, example uh, dispersed across the geographic barrier and then found a new population and over time that diverged and we have two species. And alternatively, we previously had a continuous population and then some geographic barrier emerged, creating a barrier's gene flow and then we end up with two different populations. Okay? We have the dispersal hypothesis, or we have a vicarious hypothesis. Vicarious means that previously we had one big area, and then some barrier came in to um, split it apart. So there's a different kind of uh, ancestral reconstruction here, um, um, looking at uh, ancestral areas. Um, we did this dispersal vicarious analysis, which is an alternative method for reconstructing ancestral areas. What you do is you take your phylogeny um, and you plot your areas on it, so area A and area B. If at our 
um, ancestral reconstruction, we have both A and B. Then we have a vicariant pattern where a large ancestral area has been split apart, so that we end up with just A and just B. Okay? Alternatively, if we just have area A or area B at um, the ancestral um, node, what we have is an uh, uh, assumption of dispersal, that if this was a B, then we would have a dispersal to area A and then a gradual change. In order to do this kind of analysis, the first step is to basically classify your, your um, areas into sub-areas or regions that you think are um, uh, plausible or biologically important. And then we do this ancestral state reconstruction. So we've got um, our areas labelled with letters. And then we do our ancestral reconstruction, okay? Where we've got uh, Sycamon, Rapandum, and Valiaricum, currently in areas B and E, A and E. And the ancestral area is um, reconstructed at area E, okay? Where you've got little um, stars, this is a um, uh, vicariant event where we've got areas F and G with the assumption that these split apart so that G then became Tickham um, and and F became Interminata. What you notice about this kind of ancestral area reconstruction is as you move to the base of the phylogeny you get this gradual build-up of areas and it's very, very common that you end up with the uh, basal areas being essentially everywhere that you've seen any of your extant taxa. Okay? So this, this sort of uh, analysis has got uh, a limited value in terms of reconstructing basal areas because it's very common that you just get every area as the ancestral area. 